and all the White House is not. Good evening, Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Seth McGowan. I'm of course the Vice President of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory and I'll be your host again this evening. We are proud once again to bring you the next presentation in our Cygnus series, this series of live virtual and interactive educational presentations has taken place each week and will actually end next Friday with our final uh, talk at seven o'clock p.m. And we developed this series as a way to continue our educational programming uh, throughout the social distancing and uh, limited gatherings. So uh, we hope to see you again uh, next week uh, and uh, we'll do some more periodic um, lectures over the course of the winter and into the spring. And you'll, you'll get some more information about that as, as we go. In the same spirit, we are also now uh, fully capable of live virtual and interactive stargazing. Uh, so uh, keep a check of your email and our website and Facebook. We'll be posting those events as they occur, probably without much notice in advance. The uh, clear skies seem to be fleeting these days. So uh, when they're available, uh, perhaps even a few hours before, we'll be sending out as much notification as we can. So check out uh, those. For those of you new to the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, you'll notice our location is perfectly suited for astronomy given our class four Bortle skies, but that's not all. Our Astro Science Center is under development and will become an important feature in the region. The numerous interactive exhibits within the museum will educate and thrill visitors as we Earth being uh, continue our exploration into space. In addition to the great exhibit hall, our continuing hands-on approach to astronomy is our maker space, which is an interactive learning experience where visitors will engage in virtual reality, telescope making, and so much more. Our spacious lecture hall will be a great place for larger groups to hear about the wonders of space, and our premier state-of-the-art digital planetarium will take you on trips beyond your imagination. We invite you to become part of this exciting uh, future by becoming a member of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, or uh, even better, considering a, consider giving a gift um, to us for our capital project to make the Astro Science Center a reality. So on with tonight's show. Before we begin, you'll notice that your microphones are muted. Uh, we do this to ensure that there's no extraneous noise from the background uh, in your location so that everyone will be able to enjoy the presentation uh, as, they, as they like. Uh, there'll be a question and answer period uh, immediately following. Also, you'll notice uh, throughout the lecture, if your chat window is not open, uh, go ahead and open that and I'll be posting some of the links uh, that, uh, that I've mentioned or that are important uh, throughout the form uh, throughout the lecture. Uh, uh, this lecture, as all of our other ones, are available on YouTube. This one will be posted tomorrow morning, sometime before noon, on our YouTube channel. Uh, you'll be provided to a, with a link for that also. Anyway, it's now my pleasure to welcome back to the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, straight from Clarkson University's physics department. Assistant Professor and Director of the Reynolds Observatory, Dr. Josh Thomas. Tonight's presentation, Blue Sunsets and Other Scattered Light. Take it away, Josh. All right, thanks, Seth. Just switching the inputs here. Hopefully I'm sharing screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, thank you uh, for the introduction, Seth. Um, so uh, we've got a, a nice little uh, picture here, uh, which was the advertisement picture. And it, uh, if you haven't guessed, is a, a blue sunset. And so uh, the point of this talk is to figure out what in the world it is that we're looking at. Uh, some of you may already know, so stay tuned. Um, maybe you'll still learn something. Um, 
And as last time, make sure you're taking notes because there's a quiz at the end. <laughs> so um, a brief little background. Uh, we're gonna briefly touch on what is light and how it scatters and a little bit about what it can tell us. Um, and then some examples from near and far. Um, some of these photos are mine, some are from the web, and um, I've tried to denote that where possible. So um, you'll see this uh, sunset picture again, so uh, I can talk about it later. All right, so uh, I'm an optical astronomer. I study the light that we can see with our eyes, um, but there is a few other ways that we can study the universe. Um, the one that has, uh, pun intended, made waves in uh, recent years um, and is allowing us to learn a lot more about how the universe works. Um, however, um, you know, most of what we know about the universe uh, has been learned by studying light. Uh, the image on the right here is the uh, great uh, globular cluster in Hercules. Um, this I pulled from the uh, astronomy picture of the day, apod.nasa.gov. And um, you can see, uh, uh, this is what's called a globular cluster. So there's a, a, a tightly packed ball of stars. Some are red, some are blue. Um, and if you were in my previous talk, I talked a little bit about how the color of the star relates to the temperature of the star. And so we learned that the blue stars were red. Uh, so, wow. Mm. We learned that blue stars were hot and we learned that the red stars are cooler. Um, more on that in a bit. So what is light? Um, light is uh, a wave. Uh, it can also be treated as a particle. Uh, and there's a rather famous debate in scientific history about which it is. Uh, it turns out you need the mathematics of both waves and particles to describe all the phenomena that we observe that light does. Um, today I'm gonna be focusing on the wave part of that. Um, so light is an electromagnetic wave. So that's just the words electricity and magnetism smashed together so that we can sound uh, fancy. So electromagnetic waves are electric fields and magnetic fields, and they, it turns out, are able to propagate themselves through space without material. Um, it's a transverse wave. So an example of a transverse wave is down here at the bottom. Uh, this faucet is uh, uh, leaking, needs to be replaced. Um, and uh, there's a little drip of water that hits the surface of otherwise still water and causes ripples. You get the same thing if you throw a rock in a pond. Um, the waves on the surface there represent um, transverse waves, just meaning it looks like if you took a rope and wiggled it up and down. Um, that's also a transverse wave. Um, so uh, you may know the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Or if you're, I guess, a regular person, you learn it as 186,000 miles per second. And for this talk, I thought, gee, you know, it takes light 8.3 minutes to get from our sun to us. And so what is the speed of light in the distance between Earth um, and the sun? So that distance between the Earth and the sun is 1 AU, or astronomical unit. It turns out that light travels at about 7.2 AU per hour. Um, and if you happen to know anything about the size of the solar system, which, you know, you're attending this talk, so I expect you have that all memorized. Um, that's sarcasm, by the way. Um, the, this is almost exactly halfway between Jupiter and Saturn. So I thought that was kind of cool. So in one hour, light from the sun makes it between, to between the orbit of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Pretty cool, I thought. So, all right. Um, so light's a wave, and uh, up at the top here, we've got two different examples. Um, if we plot the waving, the vertical part, versus time, then we can uh, measure the frequency, um, which is one over seconds or cycles per seconds. Um, uh, that unit gets uh, renamed to Hertz, uh, like the car rental company. Um, if we plot it versus distance, then we, ca we call this quantity wavelength. And um, it turns out the, they're inversely related, and I'll talk about that in a second, but um, these are how we determine basically the color of light. And then the bottom, we can also talk about light in terms of its energy. And so this top wave represents one with more energy. So if you imagine doing this experiment, you know, you find a friend 
and you want to stay socially distanced from them. So you get uh, a jump rope, which according to some random website I looked up, if you're four foot something or other, then the correct jump rope length is about seven feet. So um, wiggle this thing up and down. And you probably know from experience that it takes a lot more energy to wiggle it like the top image than the bottom. So big crazy infographic about light. Light is an electromagnetic wave. Spectrum just means that we spread things out in some way, whether it's by wavelength or frequency or energy. So the little wavy thing at the top, we've got long waves over here, short waves over here, and then the middle row or the words here, radio all the way out through gamma ray. And notice the visible part of the spectrum, this is what we see with our eyes, is only a tiny little part of this enormous um, category of electromagnetic radiation or what I call light. Um, and so the little rainbow right here represents the visible light. Um, there are some examples of how long the wavelengths of light are here in some uh, cute fashion. So at the bottom is a reference back to what I talked about uh, in my previous lecture about hotter things being bluer, which corresponds to more energy, and cooler things being redder. And uh, that's not going to be a huge focus of this talk. Um, we're here to talk about blue light, uh, blue sunsets and scattered lights. So what is that? Um, sort of in a nutshell, this is like the most technical slide and everything from here out is uh, mostly show and tell. So um, when I talked before uh, in my previous lectures, you can go to YouTube and watch that because those are all archived now. Um, I talked about uh, how various elements emit or absorb certain frequencies only. But it turns out uh, that's because the electron can only go from one level to another in the atom. Now, if you take an electron and take it out of the atom, it has no such constraints. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the freshman that's gone to college, can do whatever it wants. So this electron can absorb and re-emit re or scatter, uh, it's not quite the right wording, but basically the electron has a negative charge. The light is a electromagnetic wave. It's an electric field that gets stronger and then weaker and switches directions and gets weaker and goes back up. And so what it does is it wiggles the electron up and down, but it so happens that when you wiggle an electron up and down, it emits light. Um, and in fact, this is how radio stations work. The antenna at the radio station sends an electrical signal into a very long piece of metal that causes electrons in the metal to wiggle up and down. And then wiggling up and down electrons in the antenna cause an electromagnetic wave, which then uh, goes through the air to your radio. And I guess not many radios have antennas on top of them anymore, but um, the old school ones did. And uh, you'd have to pull the antenna out right and position it just right. And then what happens is that electromagnetic wave oscillates, causes electrons in the metal to move up and down. And that's possible because metal is a conductor. And the reason why metal is a conductor is because electrons can move easily uh, from one atom to the next. They're basically jumping from one atom to the next. Um, and that's why the electric wires in your house, for example, conduct electricity. All right, so the point of this talk isn't to like go into gory detail about atomic physics and all of that, but I just wanted to point you to some words. If you're interested, you can go look up some more. So um, there's two main types of scattering here. There's wavelength independent um, with names like Thompson and Me. Uh, these are either electrons or large particles. And the, the whole point of this is the independent part. It means it will scatter light of any wavelength or any color. So any color light can be scattered. And the important thing is that the color coming in is equal to the color coming out. So scattering is kind of like reflection. In fact, reflection is basically a scattering process. Then there's wavelength dependent processes where basically the color is affected by the scattering. 
and that is these two names, Rayleigh and Tyndall. Um, and then they're a little odd because they're large and small particles, but uh, I'll show you some examples of it and I think they're pretty cool. So. If anyone can tell me where I took this in the Adirondacks, um, I guess I'll give you some bonus points on the quiz. Um, I took this somewhere in the Adirondacks, but I have forgotten where. The sky is blue. The clouds, well, parts of the clouds are white. Parts of the clouds are almost gray. Uh, the trees are various color because I apparently took this in the fall. Um, and then we've got the surface of the water here. And so there's a whole bunch of scattering going on here. And that's how we see the world is light is shining on everything and it's scattered and then comes to our eye. So things that are green, for example, like these evergreens um, absorb most of the colors and then just reflect only the green or you know, scatter it back, you could say. The sky is blue and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, the clouds are this white and gray. So the blue and the white and gray are uh, the wavelength independent or the color, it'll scatter any color. And so these top two, the gray, these are called gray scattering. And that's why I drew these in gray here, uh, meaning that it doesn't, it doesn't care about the color of the light. It'll just scatter anything. And the result is, um, if we look at the word electron here, and I said that earlier when I talked about the antenna, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but have you noticed that pretty much every single metal is the same color with the exception of two, gold and copper? Pretty much all metal is gray of some kind. And the reason for that is that the electrons that make them conductors easily move, and that means they also easily scatter light. And so that means everything that falls on them gets scattered. Now, in the case of uh, copper and gold, it's a little different. Um, and, you know, I can give you some buzzwords for that if you want, but uh, <laughs> that's also not the point of today's talk. Um, all right, so gray, gray scattering, clouds, and I'm gonna say that white's basically gray. Uh, blue represents the Rayleigh scattering or the wavelength dependent, the, the color changing scattering. So on my little uh, cartoon here, um, I've got the sun, and I've got a cloud, and I've got a person, and I got the earth, and I've got various little arrows all over the place. So the, I tried to draw them in, in pairs, so everywhere there's a, a, where I want to think about light going, um, I've got a, a red and a blue. And, you know, lasers point in one direction but light from the sun goes in all directions. So when I draw this, I'm just picking a few and saying, okay, let, let's just consider this and see what happens. Um, also, uh, you know, one of the things being a physicist is you know a lot of stuff and you sometimes forget what, what you didn't know when you started. Um, I was teaching astronomy last spring and I had a laser in class and uh, you know, the light, the little laser dot showed up on the wall and, and I had a student ask um, like, he wanted to know how the, I forget, I forgot what I was going to say, <laughs> but he was really confused about how the light got from point A to point B. Oh, I, I think I, I did some chalk dust to show that the, the beam, of uh, the, the laser beam, and he was confused as to why all of the light was still making to the wall, and, and in fact, it's not all of the lights making it to the wall. So if you imagine this little uh, pair here, this red-blue pair, um, they go along and then they hit something to scatter off of. Now it turns out for the blue sky, um, it's scattering off molecules. So it turns out that type of scattering is uh, gonna change the color of the light basically. So red light doesn't scatter easily this way, but blue light does. And it can go in a bunch of different directions, but I drew the one that landed on my eye. So what that means is when I look over here at the sky, the sky looks blue. If I look over at the cloud, um, that one's more complicated. The light's gonna probably bounce around inside a lot, um, but basically it's gray scattering. So I tried to, uh, meaning it doesn't change the color. So it should basically be white. So it should get all of the colors. So I tried to denote that by putting a red and a blue. Now what happens if you look straight at the sun, which you probably shouldn't do? Um, 
Well, you're going to get light from the sun, uh, all the colors. And I drew a couple pairs here. Um, so I, one of the blues got scattered out of my line of sight, meaning it just doesn't get to my eye. Um, now, when the sun is high in the sky, you know, the sun's kind of more or less whitish, meaning it's got more or less all the colors. Um, but you know that sunsets are not that color. And so uh, what happens in the sunset case is we scatter out more of the blue and more of the blue until only the red is left. And I have another diagram for that. So stay tuned. Something else that's kind of cool is uh, this picture. So um, Seth and I were chatting right before this, and he brought up photography, and he brought up uh, polarizing light. So this picture is of the same spot and the same, it's essentially the same time. The difference is that the front of the camera had what we call a polarizing sheet on it. And basically, you can think of a picket fence. So here's my fingers. Uh, you can imagine my fingers are a picket fence. So if I wiggle a rope up and down like so, then the wiggling can get through my fingers. But if I wiggle side to side, like take a rope and wiggle it side to side, and I have the same picket fence, then I'm not going to be able to go through the picket fence. And that's what a polarizer does. So I have here uh, my sunglasses that I wear every day because I hate bright light. And I'm going to put it in front of the camera here. And as I rotate this thing, I can uh, seemingly appear and disappear into my virtual background. And the reason for that, and you'll notice it's actually more interesting right about here because you know I'm not blocking it with my hand, but you can see that the brightness has changed a little bit. And so, um, the reason why I wear polarized sunglasses is because reflections are polarized and this blocks out the reflected light. Um, and you can see the difference between these two images here. The one on the left is more bright and the one on the right is darker. We've, we've cut out some of the light. And um, what I find fascinating is, you know, everyone always talks about, well, why is the sky blue? You know, it's the children's question. Why is the sky blue? I went and did a summer research uh, uh, where I had to walk like 40 minutes to the lab in North Carolina and it was hot and I wore sunglasses because yeah well uh, I just happened to tip my head sideways one day and I noticed that the brightness of the sky changed and let me tell you as, a, as someone who's trying to constantly observe the world around them I was like why did no one ever tell me the sky is polarized and I actually went to the library and started checking out books on optics and anyway um, the universe is a fun place. So uh, this type of scattering is polarized. So we can actually use polarization to study the universe as well. Um, and some people do that. Now, this is related to what I've been talking about here, the blue sky with Rayleigh scattering. Um, this uh, stone here, um, the, the sunlight's coming in from the right and it's scattering around inside and it preferentially scatters the blue. So when I look at the stone, it looks blue, but the light that makes it through is red. And that's effectively what's going to happen here in our next picture, uh, the next slide. Uh, so this is actually not caused by uh, small molecules. This is caused by larger molecules. Um, and this is technically called the Tyndall effect. Um, and this is also why your blue eyes are blue, or your hazel eyes, or your uh, greenish eyes are all caused by this scattered light um, and not so much a pigment. Um, brown eyes are different, but the, the blue eyes, it's the same sort of scattering. And so when, you, when people say like, oh, my eyes change color with what I'm wearing, it's really more the lighting that they're in. So that's kind of cool. All right. So my second picture in this whole presentation, do you remember what it was? It was the sunset. Um, the sunset from on top Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So what you see here are the clouds. And this is uh, another peak of the mountain. This is the foreground that I'm standing on. And you'll notice the blue sky. 
But you notice as you get closer to the sun, uh, it gets redder. And when you look right at the sun, uh, it's uh, red. And so what's happened is the blue light that's making, the, the light that's coming from the sun contains the red and the blue. And the blue light is getting scattered uh, to make the sky basically look blue. But it's, that means it's taking the blue light out of the direction we're looking toward the sun. Now, you know that the sun wasn't that color uh, before. Um, so, you know, obviously the sun doesn't randomly change temperature from uh, morning to, or some, from noon to sunset. The sun stays the same color. So the color change here is not intrinsic or a property of the sun, but rather a result of the fact that we live on this planet that thankfully has an atmosphere. So what is, how does that work? Well, I got a little picture. That's sunset. Blue circle represents the atmosphere. Brown circle is the earth. Red dot is you. I don't know why I made it red, but it's red. And the black line is how much of Earth's atmosphere you have to look through. And then hopefully you guessed that the orange thing is the sun. So if you are standing here on this spot on the Earth and you look straight up, uh, then you look through the least amount of air and you can see the sun. Now that means that this person is standing somewhere between plus and minus 23 and a half degrees lat uh, latitude um, because the sun is never directly overhead in Potsdam. But anyway, sunset. So look how much more air you have to look through at sunset in order to see the sun. So there's so much more opportunity for the light to get scattered that it, all of the blue light basically gets scattered out, leaving you just the red. Now, un another interesting fact is that, see this, this dotted gray line here is the continuation of this straight line. The dashed line is the path the light actually takes. Have you ever taken a pencil and stuck it in a glass of water and it looks like the pencil bends? That's called refraction. And it turns out Earth's atmosphere does this as well. And so it turns out that when you look toward the sun at sunset, because of refraction, the sun is actually technically below the horizon. When you see the sun going down, it's technically already below the horizon. Um, take my 400 level astrophysics class and I'll make you do that as a homework problem. All right, now what was the first picture in this presentation? That was that one, only this time I've animated it. So it looks like a sunset. Um, you can probably tell if you look at the image attribution that it's from NASA. Uh, so this is a sunset, it turns out, on Mars. Um, this was taken by the Curiosity rover, I think, Gusev Crater. And uh, here is that first image from the beginning, my title slide. So the sky is almost pink, red colored. And looking at the sunset, like the sky turns blue and then uh, the sun uh, maybe looks a little blue or a little white. So what in the world's going on? You said that blue light gets scattered out. Well, like most things in science, it's, it's obviously a little more complicated. It turns out Mars's atmosphere is very, very, very thin. Um, and, and it's made up of mostly carbon dioxide. And uh, if you know about Mars, you know that Mars has these huge planet-wide dust storms. So Mars has a lot of dust in its atmosphere. And so on a normal day on Mars, the sky takes on this sort of pinky hue. And it turns out that at sunset, you're looking through more of the Martian atmosphere, just enough so that you can get this blue light scatter. Um, I think that's pretty cool. The next slide uh, brings, things, brings this dust thing a little closer to home. Um, now, you probably have seen some really weird pictures coming out of California with all of the forest fires. I could not find one that required permission. So this was the only one I could find on a free picture site. So the sun's pretty high up in the sky. So this is not sunset. But 
the sky is weird looking, right? It's very, it's got all this red and it, it almost looks more like Mars. And it turns out that the, that the forest fires, of course, when you have a fire, you have smoke. And when you have smoke, you have all sorts of particles that get sent up into the air. And that affects the color of the air and uh, what the sun's gonna look like, perhaps even blocking it out. Um, so that's a, a, a place where we can tell that there's something in the air. It, well, you probably knew that from smelling it. So I guess we didn't learn anything too exciting that way. But we can take the same logic here and apply it to this next picture, which I took in 2015 on the, the bank of the St. Lawrence River in Montreal during a total lunar eclipse. And what you notice is we haven't quite reached uh, totality. There's still a little bit of white here, but the moon kind of takes on this red color. And sometimes, uh, you know, the media advertises blood moon or whatever they call it. Um, and so what in the world is this? I have a diagram for that. So here is my uh, sun that I learned to draw when I was, you know, probably two or whatever. And there's the atmosphere again. And here's the Earth. The brown circles the Earth. And then uh, over here, I have my picture of the moon. So what happens is that sunlight, which contains the, the red and the blue together, all the colors, um, shines everywhere on the Earth. But I just drew one little pair of uh, points or uh, paths here. And so the blue light, we know, we learned, gets scattered around, making the air look blue. But the red light doesn't get scattered as much. And some of it, not all of it, but some of it can actually make it to land on the surface of the moon when the moon is directly behind the Earth as viewed from the sun. And so during something like a lunar eclipse, um, you can actually get this uh, red color uh, which is light from the sun being scattered and uh, made dimmer through the Earth's atmosphere, which I think is, again, pretty cool that it's all related. It's not like, oh, the, it's red just now. No, like that red light's always there. It just so happens the moon's moving through it. Um, so I think that's another cool thing. So here's another photo uh, that I took. Um, when I was flying back uh, from Albany, New York to Messina on uh, one of the little Cape Air Cessnas where uh, everyone else had uh, canceled their flight and I was the only passenger. Um, that was pretty cool. And I was like, do you guys mind? You know, like the pilots are like right there in front of me. And I'm like, do you mind if I take a picture? And they're like, just as long as you don't use a flash. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want a flash. So um, you might recognize some of these peaks because this is the Adirondacks. Um, and I'm not gonna hazard which one, but I, might, I think one of these might be whiteface. So uh, somebody can get bonus points if they figure out which one it is. But what I wanna draw your attention to is the color. I mean, why, look at the far away mountains, look at the closer, the, the middle set of range, and then look at the closest mountains. The closest mountains, almost look a little green like the because they're covered in trees and snow but the further away you go the more blue it looks in fact it starts to almost look like the air the atmosphere itself and so you know sometimes people say that air is a colorless gas and i i disagree i think air actually ends up being sort of a blue color um and you know on the small size right the air here isn't blue but this has to do with how far you're looking through something. And so astronomers call this optical depth, but you've all experienced this if you've ever driven in the fog. Um, here's a picture out from uh, the building I work in uh, on two different days. The one on the right is when it was particularly foggy and you can't see uh, past these cars down here. But uh, on this other day where it was clearer, you can see this distant ridge. Um, so why is that? Why can't you see so far? Well, because you're looking into this gas which contains water droplets. That's what fog is basically. So when you're looking into it, 
uh, you can only see so far before the, the light that you're trying to look through, the, the spot that you're trying to look through, ends up landing on one of these water droplets, basically. So notice also that it seems to be uniform in color. It's kind of gray. So that gives you another sense here that this is one of those wavelength independent scattering. Um, it's probably me scattering uh, for those that want to know fancy things. But anyway, um, I'm going to actually skip for time the next picture and go to this one. So this is a galaxy. Um, obviously, I didn't take this one. That was a Hubble Space Telescope image. Um, but this galaxy is pretty bright. It's got lots of stars all throughout. But what you notice out here are these dark spots. And that's places where you can't see through the gas and dust that's there. And why is that? Well, the light is coming toward us. But what happens is the light goes into that gas. It hits stuff and scatters out. And that happens a lot. So it makes it look opaque or not. So it's not transparent, so you can't see through it. Um, so that's something. And I have a slide for that, which I don't see, so I, I think it must be a little later. Um, it's another pretty space picture. This is the Pleiades star cluster, known as M45, or the logo on the front of my car, if you drive Subaru. Um, each of these stars, um, happens to also be blue. They're actually all very hot blue stars. But notice that there's gas around them. And what's happening is same reason the sky is blue. Light from the star is going out in all directions. And some of it hits the gas. And then its direction gets changed and comes toward the Earth. And it happens to depend on the color of the light. And so it scatters the blue more than the red. And so here's another example of this. Um, the picture on the left I took here at Clarkson with our telescope. Um, notice there's a star in the middle, there's some blue stuff around the side, and then there's dark stuff where I can't see through. And how that works is another one of my terrible drawings. Um, I've got this blue star in the middle here, and I've got the wiggly stuff around it, which is supposed to represent the gas and dust around this uh, star. And I have picked several directions here where I've got pairs of blue and uh, red light. And the light that's coming straight toward us is not affected as much. But all of these light, uh, all these rays that go out in directions that would never hit our eyeball, this is the giant space eyeball, by the way. This is what we use to look at the universe. Um, the red light doesn't get scattered, but the blue light does. And so when we look at the thing, the, the, the material around the star looks blue. And so we call these reflection nebula because scattering is basically reflection. So um, astronomers don't get too creative with their names. All right. Um, how much longer should I go, Seth? Hey, it, uh, your call. Uh, maybe if there's another couple of pictures. Oh, a couple? Hmm. All right, so I have another couple pictures. So I'm switching to cool things. Slide 34. Uh. So this is uh, on top of Mount Wilson from spring of a couple of years ago. And uh, for those that have been watching the news in California, there's been lots of fires. And it turns out that uh, the fires got within 20 feet of some of the historic buildings on top of Mount Wilson. Uh, thankfully, they saved the observatory. Um, so there's some radio towers over here. And up here uh, at the very top, you can maybe make out a little bit of blue sky. But then you see all this white cloud here. So clouds are water droplets. Water droplets are big. They scatter the light uh, independent of wavelength, or rather, they do the gray scattering I was talking about. So clouds look sort of white or gray. But if you look carefully a little lower, the color of this cloud is different. And I would say that this stuff is blue. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out uh, right in the middle of our observing run, uh, we had to stop because they were doing controlled burns to uh, 
try to mitigate some of the fire risk. And so what you see here is smoke from fires that they were uh, lighting around the um, base of the mountains. And uh, why is it blue? Well, the particles, the smoke particles are, are smaller than the water droplets in the, in the clouds. And since the particles of smoke are smaller uh, in this case, uh, they're actually scattering uh, blue more than they do red. And uh, this is, you can also see this a little bit, uh, it's a similar but related effect with, uh, slightly different but related effect with uh, like, uh, when you've got a, like a two cycle engine that uh, starts to burn its oil and you get that little bit of blue smoke coming out of the machine, um, that's related to this sort of thing as well. Um, and uh, I think I'll end it there. Well, very, very informative. Can I be the first to ask a, a question though? I, sure. I've got my own question tonight. Usually I turn it over to our guests, but if we go back to the Mars sunset where you're looking directly through, you know, along the horizon at that, uh, at that sunset. So am I right in, in, in imagining that the amount of atmosphere that, because Mars is a thinner atmosphere than earth, that because it's a, and we know that at the horizon level, we're looking through much more atmosphere, then that looking through that amount of atmosphere at the horizon level on Mars is roughly equivalent to looking directly up in, in uh, I want to say in the United States, but on Earth. Yeah. Does that? That's how, that's my naive interpretation of this as well, that when you're, uh, if this, if we replace the the brown here for Earth with a red circle to be Mars, um, the amount of light that we're looking through at sunset on Mars, or the amount of atmosphere, sorry, uh, that we're looking through, the the path length would be um, um, longer than looking straight up on Earth, possibly. Although the atmospheres aren't the same thickness, mm -hmm. but Mars's atmosphere is so much thinner that you know, by looking along the horizon, you're starting to approach what it might be like to look up on Earth. Okay. Yeah. All That's right. my interpretation of that. Yeah. All right. Good. Mine too. <laughs> All right. Let's open it up to questions from everybody else. Uh, I see a hand raised. Um, I'd ask if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself, uh, but let's be uh, cognizant that more than one person may, may have a question at a time. So, if you have a question, uh, unmute yourself and, uh, and go for it, and we'll see what happens. Josh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I have two questions. They may be off the wall, but I'm going to go for them anyway. <laughs> All right. Can you, can you explain green flash mm -hmm. at sunset and why there are purple mountain majesties or there aren't? Oh, um, well, I can answer the first one. Um, why do we see green flash? So that's a sunset phenomena, so that for those that may not know. Um, and if we look at the picture of sunset here on Earth, um, this picture doesn't really show that well. But what happens is because of refraction, um, as the sun is going down and getting closer to looking like it's disappearing, even though it's already gone, um, the atmosphere is really turbulent there. Right, you're looking through a lot of atmosphere, you have a lot more opportunity for there to be uh, big fluctuations in temperature. And why that matters is it turns out that, uh, you know, the index of refraction, if you, if you stick the pencil uh, into the glass of water and it looks like it bends, the, how much it bends depends on this property we call the index of refraction. It turns out that in air, the index of refraction depends greatly on the temperature, the humidity, and the pressure. And so you can get all it when the, you know, the air is constantly moving and it's turbulent. And so you, what happens with the sun setting, sometimes the, the order in which the rays are uh, traveling get a little out of order. And so what happens is you can sometimes end up with the green light appearing slightly above the actual image of the sun 
Uh, and so that's the green flash. Wow. Uh, uh, Purple Mountain's Majesty, uh, that's an excellent question. I don't know. Um, I, I can't answer that one. But it's probably maybe a refraction. Uh, I'll, I'll just say it's maybe refraction related. I'm not sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Seth, that's Bridget here. I can't see anybody. Can is there is there something wrong why I can't see anybody tonight? Um, I I don't know. Um, I can see something on your screen. You've got your camera on. Um, yeah. I, I I don't know where you're where you're pointed. Uh, it, it's hard to tell, Bridget. I, I uh, okay. Yeah, I have. I'm I'm working on my iPad tonight, and I can't see anybody except the you. Like I see you, and then I see the um, the announcer. The um, you see Josh, the speaker. I okay. see Josh when you come go back and forth like this, but I don't see anybody else. And when I press on participants, it says there's 24, but I don't see anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And that's right. You'll see on your screen, whoever's talking should pop up on your screen. Yeah, they do. Okay. But sometimes I see like everybody across the top. Okay. I guess it's different. Okay. That's fine. But you can see me. Okay. Um, I can see something there. I'm not sure what it, what it is in your... Uh, I, I can. Um, I think we're looking for the outward facing camera. Okay, you can see now? No? No, there we go. Okay, all right, I'll leave it there. Switch camera. Oh, I was probably showing you the back of my, back of my wall. <laughs> okay. But I don't see anybody. All right, then. Okay, I have no questions. I, I find this very interesting because I do a lot of photography on sunsets. Oh, great. How about a reflected light, uh, reflected light question from anybody? What have we got out there? Stunned silence. Stunned silence, wow. Uh, Oh, we have a question from, from Todd. Blue snow, is it just me or does the snow on the ground appear bluish on a clear winter sunset? That's from Todd. Possibly. Um, I mean, it's possible that it takes on a bluish, uh, could be reflecting the sunlight. Um, I mean, or the light from the air, I don't know. I know, I know like mirages, mirages are all reflect, uh, refracted light of, di of the distant sky. So um, it could be related to that. The, the problem, I'll just say like, there are so many atmospheric phenomena that I, I, I don't know if anyone knows them all. Like there's, a, there's actually tons and tons. I, and actually there's one I skipped over here. Um, uh, so this is Ooh. a, yeah. So this is a pretty cool picture. Uh, showing all the, you know, the blue sky, the white clouds, the darker gray clouds. Um, but there's this little rainbow over here. And it turns out um, this rainbow, these are called sun dogs. And so if you looked at this other photo, um, so the sun's in the center, and then you see almost like this, you can imagine this circle. Uh, and then there's two spots where you see this little bit of a rainbow. And so these uh, sun dogs are actually, um, light that's reflecting off of ice crystals in very high up clouds called cirrus clouds. And um, actually, if you have a pair of solar polarized sunglasses, it makes them easier to spot. Um, these are pretty cool. I've seen them. Um, but yeah, there's tons that I, I, I don't know about. I will say with the, uh, with the blue snow, I find that it, it, uh, it, it tends to take on a bluish hue when um, just as it starts to melt a little bit. Not, not when it becomes slush, obviously, but after it's fallen and maybe some sun is shining on it, there's that moment that it kind of starts to melt slightly across the top. I always, I do find that there's a, kind of a bluish tint or your hue to it and I, I wonder if that's because the water makes it seem more reflective. Maybe. Jeffrey? Ethan, Ethan do you have a question? I see your hand up. Oh yeah um, I want to know 
if another light could stop another light and I want to know um how um if um light can go um like at it and then bounce off and then go the exact opposite. Uh -huh. So yes, uh if you have like a mirror and you send light toward it, it can actually bounce straight back. And that can also happen if you have uh, particles, uh, dust particles or whatever they are in space, um, you can actually get this backwards light scattering. And I didn't put it in my presentation, but there's actually, if you Google, um, maybe if there's an adult there, <laughs> there's a German word, it's Gegenschein. Um, which means backward shine or reflection. And um, this is actually a light from our, the dust in our solar system that scatters back to us. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, and actually, could you repeat the first question? I didn't hear you, the, all of the questions. I didn't questions. get that either, Ethan. Um, and also, I will had... tell them the first question. It was about light bouncing off of other light. Is yeah. That what you're asking about? Um, yeah. Um, so light um, doesn't bounce off of other light, but it can interact with other light. Um, so you can, um, you can, because light's a wave. Um, it turns out if the waves are like, like, like this, like my hands, and if they're on top of each other, they can actually cancel each other out. Um, it's uh, called interference, and all waves do that. You can do it with sound. You can do it with. Uh, do you? Uh, you know, I don't. I don't have them with me. But uh, if you've got noise canceling headphones, yeah, they he's got work. some for school. Okay, so those noise canceling headphones, the way they work is they send uh, a wave that's uh, actually exactly opposite. I'm sorry, it's exactly opposite, and they cancel out. And so. Uh, light can do that same thing. So then it would make it dark there. Yes, it would make it dark. Yes. And if they overlap, you could get positive interference and change the color, right? Um, well, it depends on what you're interfering. Right. Um, yeah. In fact, you can use, if you have a laser pointer, um, mm -hmm. you can use a laser pointer and one of your hairs and you can shine the laser on the hair and uh, if you project that onto the wall, you'll get what's called an interference pattern. And it looks like a bunch of little, little dots of light. And okay. if, if you're creative and you measure some of those, you can actually use those measurements to figure out how Is thick your hair. hair. Oh, it sounds like a fun experiment. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Josh, we have a question from uh, Michael. Are temperature dependent refraction and air turbulence the cause of the distortion over hot asphalt? Uh, yes, the distortion over hot asphalt um, is caused by that. And uh, that hot asphalt causes a, a gradient in temperature, which actually, if you're far enough away, that, that whole, that's, it, it's, it's, it's just like the mirage effect, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to take this one step further, uh, stars twinkle. And that twinkling is caused by the same process. Um, there's little pockets of air, especially if the air is really windy. Um, you're going to get the light trying to come straight to you. But what happens is some of the light, the, the light will hit like a pocket where it refracts a little bit and it'll hit another pocket and refract a little bit and so on. And so it looks like the star dances around when you're trying to look at it. Um, so. Okay. Uh, Bridget, do you have, it looks like you've got a question, at least you're waving at us. Yeah, I'd like to know, um, when looking at glacial ice, it, mm -hmm. it's blue, almost blue like the Caribbean Ocean, you know, it, it, and it's ice, and it's, uh, and sometimes you can see a lot of dirt in glacial ice, but the ice itself is really blue. What causes that to be so blue when you look uh, I'm going to go and I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's it's the same sort of uh, process here, the sort of like the Rayleigh scattering. Um, okay. Because it, it's uh, water, for example, water is 
usually blue all when you look through enough of it right you look through one glass of water yeah. and it looks clear yeah but you look yeah. through enough of it it looks blue and the ice is much more compressed um oh. okay. so yeah but so that's, my, that's yeah. a pretty blue i couldn't you know was mm. i was that impressed me up there in alaska yeah yeah okay well thank you You're well welcome. also because when i went i took a trip once on a cruise ship to the bahamas and some of the ocean when you look into the ocean water was like an ink color mm. it was like really dark 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 blue like an inky purpley color and then as you get closer to land and you get sand underneath it comes up green and then it comes up blue you know it's quite a change in colors yeah that's going to have a lot to do with uh you know whether or not there's any silt or anything in the water yes. or okay. uh, uh plankton or or uh, yeah. you know, any anything floating in the water is going to is going to affect the how it looks okay thank you yeah you're welcome we have a question from rc if light doesn't hit something to scatter does it eventually dissipate um no i don't think so because i mean is that going to happen in the real universe no because eventually light hits something um but that would like light light's going to travel light is basically energy and if light just sort of uh, you know, petered out, then that would sort of violate uh, conservation of energy. But what does happen, so when you talk about light, you kind of have to be careful a little bit because there's so much of it, right? Like the sun puts out an enormous amount of light. And um, oftentimes, uh, like when we're talking about beams of light or a laser pointer, right? That's tons of light that's coming out. And so there's like millions of particles, you could think of it that way. Um, but in some of my diagrams, like, uh, you know, for example, this one, I'm like showing one occurrence, when in fact, there's probably, uh, you know, this might represent thousands of blue photons, and only one of them scatters. So, so that's something to be a little aware of that when we talk about light, um, and the light hitting something and scattering, like the reason why you can look at the sun, you know, all the blue lights getting scattered, but you can look at the sun and it's not, uh, well, you shouldn't do that, but you, know, you can look in that general direction. Um, and, uh, you know, the sun doesn't look red at, at, at noon, let's say. Um, and the reason for that is that there's plenty of light. There's plenty of light coming from the sun. So, yeah. Um, I've got a very interesting uh, astrophotography question from Holly Chambers. Holly, I'm not sure if you can unmute. Um, please, uh, you can ask ask Josh directly, or I can I can ask for you. But this is a very interesting. Hi. Yes. Can Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm interested in. Uh, a, this is, and I came in late and I missed the uh, first 15 minutes or so, and I apologize. Um, but I'm interested in whether the colors that you see in images that, like you see in the Hubble, for example, of other planets and are not a well of uh, other plant uh, objects in the universe and phenomena. I've read that the colors that you see that we see in those pictures are quote unquote false. And I'm wondering how do those false colors relate to the light colors that you've talked about? And are there standard false colors related to light lengths or something? It's a, it's a wonderful question. In fact, when I teach my intro astronomy class, um, and I just noticed that one of my former students is in the, in the room here, so. Um, the, this was a big point I made in my class. Uh, so if you go to like, for example, astronomy picture of the day, um, I, I love that site because they always have a blurb about the science below. And in that they usually specify whether or not what you're looking at is a true color image or a false color image. And so, for example, um, if you look, um, if you look um, at, I'm uh, sorry, distracted for a second. Um, 
brain fart. Yes. So when you look, you come to the uh, Adirondack uh, Sky Center and look through our telescopes, uh, and you look at something like uh, the Orion Nebula, you're not going to see a whole lot of color. But when you look at it with Hubble, you're going to see this amazing photo. Um, for example, um, I have a one here. Yes. So here's the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope image of the Orion Nebula. Um, or the, yeah, OK. So this is actually a false color image. Um, but what does that mean? So um, maybe you've all had a pair of these at one point. Uh, these are my red and green, or red and blue um, 3D glasses. And so if I cover the camera lens with the red, or if I cover it with the blue, it only lets through red or blue light. And so often what we're doing in astronomy is taking pictures with a monochromatic camera, black and white, and we put a filter in front of it. And the reason why we do that, uh, there's a couple of reasons why we do it. Um, one is it gives us, it means that every single pixel on the, on the screen um, is either red or blue, so that when we make a color image out of it by stacking them on top of each other, I know that for this pixel, I know what the red, green, and blue intensity is. Now, in something like your cell phone, the way they do color is actually a cluster of pixels. One pixel is, has a red filter on it, one pixel has a blue filter on it, and one pixel has a green filter on it. And so the red, green, and blue are not physically on the same spot on the camera. Now, for everyday things, it doesn't really matter. But when you're trying to measure very precise positions on the sky and you want to know, you know, is this star here, how bright is it, you know, and if, what if that star only showed up in one of those pixels, only, let's say only the red pixel, then you wouldn't be able to know all of the information. So that's one thing. Um, this red, all the red in this picture here is light of uh, hydrogen. So um, the, all the pink there, the red, that's all uh, a filter that only lets through one of the red wavelengths of hydrogen. Um, I'm actually not sure what the rest of them are in here, but I can tell you that some of them are blue. Um, so you're not going to see colors like this with your own eye for two reasons. Um, uh, well, one, many times the um, they're false, but then the other reason is these images represent potentially hours and hours of exposure, and our eyes don't expose long enough to detect the color. Um, so if you want to make a color image, you need at minimum red, green, blue, and there are standard filters for that, uh, but there are several standards for that. Um, uh, many that have been used differently over time. So um, those are available. That some of them are expensive, some of them aren't. And um, yeah, uh, in fact, this color, this image here on the left, was taken at uh, Reynolds Observatory through a red, green, and blue filter. Um, and my virtual background is also taken with the telescope at Reynolds, uh, my my observatory. And that's a, a red, green, and blue image. And then I have to I have to put them together in the computer to make the color image. If I can uh, expand just slightly, uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about uh, this particular topic in, in astrophotography, uh, the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory each uh, fall, not this year because of uh, the uh, pandemic, but uh, coming back next, uh, in, next fall in 2021, we host an astrophotography conference every year. And uh, we go through the exact process that Josh was talking about of uh, separating out by filter uh, in, in various types of uh, uh, Im uh, image acquisition. It's, uh, it's also in interesting to note that the Hubble, uh, when we look at Hubble images, that they, uh, we refer to those as the Hubble palette because they're not necessarily red, green, and blue, but they're, the filters that are used there are hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Um, so they're, they're filtered at, at by 
by those frequencies uh, instead. So while they're they're not what I would call you know the the light as we would see them as if we were standing right next to the Orion Nebula, they are accurate in that they they are the light that's reflected from the hydrogen gas, the sulfur, and the oxygen as well. So that that's sort of why it, it has that false color sense. The other aspect is it of it is that we all love pretty pictures. And you know, uh, in order to make something look stunning, you know, sometimes you you give that red just a little more attention than you give the other colors in the picture to make it look extra special. But anyway, that's a uh, the astrophotography conference. If you want, uh, certainly give us a call uh, over the summer or at any time. We'll uh, send you some more information about the uh, astrophotography conference. It, I I would just want to follow up a tiny bit on that, and and so. Oftentimes, as scientists, we intentionally make false color map uh, images. We call them maps, actually, uh, sometimes, uh, because we're interested in where the hydrogen is. We're interested in where the oxygen is. We're interested in where the sulfur is. And so for us, we, it ends up maybe looking like a pretty picture, but we had a reason, like a scientific reason for making this false color image. And I'll follow up with one more thing, and that is this false color image is actually all x-ray light. Um, so, well, actually I lied. Um, at the bottom it says, uh, a vivid view of Tycho's supernova remnant, and it says Spitzer Space Telescope, that's infrared light. Chandra, which is x-ray, and uh, uh, that one, uh, which is, I'm assuming, optical. So that's uh, two, at least two wavelengths that you can't even see with the human eye. And so in order to represent that as a picture for us to study uh, where that stuff is in space, um, we have to make a false color image, so. Josh, a question. Um... Let me find it again. Are crepuscular rays, God's rays, caused by refraction of light? Um, so that's actually how I say it, although I heard someone say it, uh, sepulcher. Um, so I'm not sure which oh, is Oh, sorry. Um, but but there, there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's the, the rays like from the sun that you can see near the sun, and then there's actually anti- uh, sepulcher rays, which are on the opposite horizon. Um, I don't know what causes those. I think that's, uh, you, you basically have a shaft of light getting through a cloud. And that shaft of light is illuminating something, and some of that is scattering toward us. So if anything, I would say it's a scattering phenomena. Um, just, like, just like if you want to show someone a laser beam, you know, you have to clap some chalk erasers together so that the laser beam has something to scatter off of and come toward you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my two cents, and I could be wrong. All right. Before we wrap things up, um, I just want to post a couple of other items to our chat area if, you're, uh, if you have access to that. I mentioned earlier that we're in the middle of a capital campaign to build our Astro Science Center uh, and museum there's a link directly to a place where you can make a, a contribution, uh, become a member and so forth. Um, and, and I hope that uh, if you like tonight's lecture and uh, the, the previous ones, uh, I hope that you visit that, uh, that site. And uh, if, you, if you're interested in a uh, more significant uh, contribution to our project, um, feel free to call the office or get in touch with one of us uh, at info at adirondacksky.center.org or at 518-359-3538. And the last in our Cygnus series uh, will happen next Friday, and that is Eileen O'Donoghue with part three of three on Einstein gravity and multi-messenger astronomy. And as a bonus for attending tonight's lecture, you get the early registration, the early bird registration link is attached there too in the chat area. So if you're, uh, if you're available next Friday and like to join us for our, for our final talk of the Cygnus series, uh, register tonight and uh, you, you'll get, a, you get a, you the best seats in the house. So I wanna thank Josh again uh, for, uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, very, uh, 
very enlightening, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> talk tonight. Uh, in, enjoyed it, of course, as, as I always do. So thank you, Josh. You're welcome. And thank you to everybody who was with us tonight. Uh, hope to see you back next week. And, uh, and I, I hope the sky's clear and everybody takes a nice look up to the wilderness above. Good night, everybody. Thank you.